So thank you so much for having me here. Thank you, Jackie. Jackie. I'm going to say something about Jackie in my talk, just but uh, thank you all for being here and um, for what this is and for like holding this down and um, the willingness, because this is what it's going to take for us, is the willingness to, to show up and to, um, you know, to bear ourselves, to bear ourselves. And, and that means that we have to sit through and with and be with the discomfort of breaking down these myths, right? And breaking down and br breaking down the myths and breaking through the madness that comes with these myths. Uh, so it is not lost on me that I am a Buddhist here <laughs> that has been slotted into talking. Well, you know, what she didn't tell me that this was happening. I just, I just like, I was looking at the program and, and it didn't matter because I was going to get to be here and witness and like be in the presence of Jackie and be in the presence of Kelly. And so I was like, I'm going to go with it. Um, but I want to say in all honesty, like this is a uh, very interesting ground, right? To, for me to be, um, to be black and to be, Buddhist and to be talking about the myth of Christianity, right? Because this is, you know, we're funny. <laughs> when, when, like when we get to talking about religion, we're funny. And, and, and to be honest, of, if this had come up a few months before, I think I would have been almost too ignorant to have like had it go like, hmm, that's gonna be interesting. It, but I had a confrontation as we do and the confrontation was this. Uh, so I sit w along with uh, Jackie in a body of uh, folks in uh, Auburn Seminary, and there are a bunch of gorgeous and amazing uh, faith faith, uh, social justice-centered faith leaders. And I'm the, I'm the first, and uh, right now only, Buddhist in the group. So a couple months ago, what happened is, uh, as, as many of us know, the Methodist Church issued a statement uh, that upheld their uh, stance against gay marriage and uh, asked that they, they're, they're not ordaining, they proclaimed that they're not ordaining uh, practicing, because they maybe want us to not practice. <laughs> practicing, because pra I'm also queer. So practicing uh, LGBT f uh, folks are, n are not to be ordained if they are uh, open about it and, and actually practicing, because better to chase people into a closet. Uh, so my response to this, uh, which I don't often say, I'm not a listy person, but my response to this was to, uh, I really sat with it for a moment, and I am, am aware of the experience of division that we live in. Uh, and inside of that experience, there are particular times where it feels important to me to not respond to everything, like that feels really important to me, but that some things are important for me to feel that um, I'm, I'm naming something that, that it feels important to name. And so on our little list, I said something to the effect of, and it was, I thought about it. And what I said was that I wish ease, that I wish ease upon those folks that are caught up in heteronormative, white supremacist patriarchy. Something to, to that effect. Wish ease. Uh, and I want to be really clear here that this is not about individual people. Right, this conversation that I'm sharing is not about individual people. But one of my, uh, the, my folks, my colleagues, took issue, uh, and, f and fierce issue. It was a kind of like fast and furious um, expression of how dare you. I didn't think that you were that kind of person when I met you to attack us. And I was feeling all kind of confused. Because first of all, I didn't say anything that we hadn't said before. I had watched, in fact, and if you know her, you know my sister here, Jackie, like will say these same words 
right? To talk about it, preach them, right, from, from up here. Um, and so I was sort of like, you know, and it was a, it was a hard slap because it wasn't just, a, you know, you said this thing, but you said this and, and you're not meeting my stand, the standard of who I thought you to be. And there's all kind of interesting psychological stuff in there. And so I sat and I sat and then finally I responded and clarified for me the most important things, which is first of all, if you were offended, by all means, I had no intention to offend you because that's not my intention. I have no intention or will to harm anyone regardless of whether I think they un misunderstood or misinterpreted my words. That said, uh, I didn't say anything different. I'm, I'm actually surprised, because I didn't say anything different than I've heard said here. So it, it passed. And uh, a couple of my colleagues reached me behind the, behind the scenes and said, uh, you know, are you all right? I said, I'm, I'm fine, <laughs> I'm good, <laughs> like this is not new. Um, <laughs> the, the other thing that I said, though, that was important is, I also did not mean there, to offend anybody because by design, there are no uh, Buddhists, except if they're really young, that are also not Christian by the upbringing, by their experience, especially black Buddhists. So I am also that, and, and further had no intention to be offending any particular group of folks. This is important for me to name because what I saw immediately is the othering that took place. That there was not a recognition of the body that I come in and the experience that I am therefore inclined to have been through. So I have to have come through, in this United States of America, I have had to have come through Christianity to be whatever, right? That's the nature of the state that we live in. But that was ignored because the moment I was a Buddhist, I was an other, and, I, and therefore we were an us and we were a them. And I was a them that was offending the great, the us. And in my mind, there are a couple of things operating here. First of all, the person may not have understood that. So I state it as a fact. You know, this is actually what is true. Unless we're really young, none of us, none of us that are Buddhists, that are not ethnic heritage Buddhists, are not also, also Christian and also Jewish and also all of the, the things, right? There are some Muslim black folks. But for the most part, overwhelmingly, we have to come through the Christian experience. But that wasn't recognized, and as, and as I named it, he, here's what really I, sat with me and what I walked away with. My colleague didn't apologize. My colleague didn't say anything. And I took that as, and I placed that in the bucket of there's a lot of heat going on, and, when, and, and so people have reactivity. And so maybe they're not ready yet. But what really sat with me is that not one of my brothers and sisters, not one of my Christian brothers and sisters in that body of people said anything on, in public, in the space. No one said, you know, I've said that too. No one said, hey, let's talk about this. Uh, we, we, this you know, we didn't have to do a playground thing, <laughs> right? We didn't have to like, you know, get on in corners, but no one said, let's tease this out some. There was some backdoor stuff, but there was no naming it in the space.
What I understood about this is that we were doing the thing that we've been taught to do, which was we were maintaining confidence, confidentiality, right? We don't call each other, we don't name things. So when people are made to have their comfort affronted, when their comfort is affronted, we don't call it out straight out, we have to do it over here somewhere. So comfort and confidentiality are two mainstays of white culture. And when either one of those are offended or upended, then we exert the third one, which is control. But those three are not my, they're not my words, so I, I apologize, I forget the person that named those three things, and please look, somebody's gonna Google it, I know you are. But confident, comfort, confidentiality, and control are protocols that go along with the wide field of implicit practices and protocols that maintain whiteness. And maintaining whiteness implicitly, largely, meaning you don't recognize that it's happening, is about upholding white supremacy. It's about getting particularly white-bodied folks, but all folks, to maintain the social order of the white supremacy that Dr. Kelly so beautifully expressed. So that when we, we have this culture, and culture is a set of accepted practices and protocols, uh, their agreements, explicit but largely implicit, by which we maintain a social order. So these things, this comfort, confidentiality, and control are significant protocols to maintain whiteness, uh, their culture, uh, significant protocols of the culture of whiteness, that I would take one step further and not just say is a violent culture, but is a sociopathic culture. Because it is a culture, and I, I'm not, I don't mean it's a sociopathic culture in some sort of vague way, right, where we just say, oh yeah, that's kind of so, I mean textbook. I mean textbook. That if you go in the textbook and you say, what's the difference between a sociopath and a psychopath? That the, the psychopath has these uh, antisocial behaviors in which they are not able to relate to human suffering, but it's intrinsic to them at birth. The only difference is that a sociopath is taught that or has an experience that arises and the result of that experience is that they are no longer able to appropriately relate to other human beings. What does that sound like to you? That sounds like whiteness to me. That all the little, you know, scientific measures that when white-bodied people can no longer feel that the part of them that's supposed to light up in their brain to feel a sense of, of, of connection and empathy for the suffering of others, it is depressed when they witness the suffering of black and brown bodies. I'm not talking about your good intentions. I'm talking about what actually happens in the brain. So this sociopathy of whiteness is maintained, but it is clearly also maintained in our religions. And religion, the root word of it is to bind. And the myth of Christianity that comes through this country to uphold and maintain Anglo-Saxon exceptionalism and white supremacy, our Christianity as we received it binds us to white supremacy by design. 
And therefore, whenever we are in witness to Christian hegemony and we allow it to continue so as not to make people uncomfortable, when we don't call it in, except in confidentiality, we in our Christian bodies, we in our Christian hegemony maintain the control of white supremacy. We are ta having conversations that we suggest are somehow about faith when we talk about Muslim people. We're having a conversation about race and white supremacy and we've coded it in faith so that those of us that are adhering to Christianity and the myth of Christianity will implicitly uphold white supremacy <laughs> under the guise of the bind to their religion, under the guise of their religion. So we are bound to, to our faith and we are bound to maintaining white supremacy unless we are actively unbinding, unless we are actively unbinding. We are binding to faith and allowing ourselves to be unbound from each other. We are being bound and binding ourselves to heteronormativity, to patriarchy, under the guise of faith and putting our boots on the backs of our Muslim sisters in Congress. We are couching the conversation as a religious conversation when it is a race conversation. We are couching the conversation and the vitriol as anti-Semitic when it is actually about maintaining white supremacy. And we are caught up in the fear of it we are caught up in the fear of it by our binds to Christianity and the myth that we can have a Christianity that is not inherently bound to white supremacy unless we are actively interrogating that, actively deconstructing that, actively disrupting that. So as long as we are not actively disrupting Christian hegemonic discourse in our congregations, in our Congress halls, we are maintaining not love of our faith, but our complicity in white supremacy. Let's talk about that. Thank you so much. your part and her part, and then my sermon is written. It's amazing. 
That's what you do, but you have to attribute. At least the first time. <laughs> I'm just teasing. That's, that's, that's what some of the fellows do. We don't do that, but I love it. Somebody, you'll, be in, you'll be in a room, and I'm just being honest. I'll be in a room, and somebody will say, call it, call it. one time Dr. Jackie Lewis said so-and-so, and the next time I hear him say it, they say, as I always say. Just, <laughs> just teasing. Just teasing. You know it's true. All right, right. now. Yeah, it's true. Okay, Let's here we get are, into some and truth I want here. to get you in a conversation with them, but can I just have one question with them? Um, you told a thing. Can I tell a thing back? You tell a thing back. I'm going to tell a thing back. I'm on that, I'm in that world with, uh, with Angel, as she said, and she was saying exactly the stuff I say from my pulpit every Sunday about whiteness and Christianity and Christianity masking as white supremacy, and I mean, I go... I go crazy, right, all the time about that here. Um, and in that moment in our public space, I actually was asked, asked not to jump in mm. by, by one of our colleagues, because I always jump in. So I just want to apologize to you publicly, mm. because I think that I was controlled. Mm -hmm. And therefore I was complicit. Mm. And I'm so sorry, babe, because I love you so much. So I'm just apologize for that. Thank you. So let's, so let's talk to these amazing, badass, fantastic, smart folks with your questions. Hi, I'm Megan Foley. Um, I'm interested if you have an imagination of a country that's free of this Anglo-Saxon exceptionalism. I actually have a sense of Christianity Myself, but the country, I don't have enough imagination for. I'm wondering if you, if you guys do. I have an imagination for it. <laughs> <laughs> now the question becomes, and, and, uh, and, and I want Reverend Williams to jump in here. Our nation, let me just say briefly, our nation is, I like to describe it sometimes using Du Bois words uh, in relationship to a warring soul. Our nation is impacted by a warring soul that is indeed ingrained in the very identity and DNA in this nation. Mm -hmm. For on the one hand, this nation, you cannot get around the fact or you aren't telling the truth, that th this nation was founded mm -hmm with the thought of being a nation that, as I said before, would promote this notion of Anglo-Saxon exceptionalism. Our founding fathers were deeply dedicated to that. All one has to do, you know, because people think you're lying on them, all one's got to do is just read, pick up something easy, Thomas Jefferson's notes from the state of Virginia. Yeah. Just read that, and then, you know, you don't even have to go look at his letters that he wrote, and, so, and then you'll really be astounded. Uh, to, and Ben Franklin, and then the great emancipator, who really didn't emancipate but about 50,000 people and left millions of others enslaved, but we'll talk about that later. But, <laughs> but even he, mm -hmm. right, he never believed, and he was very clear, that emancipation did not mean equality. He, he, mm -hmm. he believed that after emancipation, immigration had to happen because black and white people couldn't live in the same space. So deeply ingrained on the one hand is this notion of Anglo-Saxon exceptionalism. Yet on the other hand, they also had this vision of a nation of justice and liberty and freedom for all. Now, of course, bear in mind, they didn't mean for anybody all, all. else, for they didn't all, mean all. all. Like, not all, all. Not all, but, you know, they're all. Right. But they're what? I mean, so America's vision of democracy has always been uh, a vision that, as uh, Charles Mills has said, that's been limited by a racial contract. Mm -hmm. And then others have said a patriarchal contract. But here's the thing, though. So we got these two mm -hmm. visions, so to speak. Even, you know, even as the one is impacted by white supremacist narratives. But this is a warring soul currently in this country. What kind of nation and what kind of people do we want to be and are we going to be? So I do have an imagination for it, 
The question is whether or not this country is, where's the real myth? Is it the myth of this democracy that is freedom and justice for all? Is that a myth in, and I mean that, this in a myth is not really? Or do we want to get rid of this other myth of Anglo-Saxon exceptionalism? So more to the question for me is how do we get to this other place that more reflects the just earth that is God's. And what does that look like to me? It looks like a place where the first are last and the last are first, not because there's a reversal of fortunes, but because there are no, the first are last, the last are first, because they're all equal and everybody yeah. is respected as the sacred child of God that they are, period, period. right? And that which you would want, that which you would want for, yourself, you want for another, that which you would not deny yourself. And this is, the, to me, the radicality of the uh, golden rule that is found in every major religion in some form or the other. The radicality of it is that which you would not withhold from yourself, don't withhold from another. Do you want food? Don't withhold it from another. Right. Do you want housing? Don't withhold it from another. You want health care? Don't withhold it from another. You want to be loved, respected, and affirmed, and walk and feel safe? in who you are, then don't withhold it from another. That's the American vision. Now, the only folks that can get us there are faith communities. And I wanna know where in the world the faith communities are. Because silence is consent to the way in which we see things right now. And, and I'll say this and shut up, to, to, to Angel's point, I'm sorry, white Christian America, not just, I'm tired of hearing about the 82% of the evangelicals that voted for this current vision. 56% of non-evangelicals, Protestants vote, white Protestants voted for this vision, and 58 to 59% of white Catholics voted for this vision. So forget about the evangelicals, white Christian America voted for their whiteness, not for their faith. <laughs> Want to add anything to that, Reverend? <laughs> I'm just taking it in. Um, fortunately, I'm endowed with a with a very very um, grand imagination, and so I I do have imagination. I think I take a different path. Um, I think it is. Uh, fallacy to think that we can vision a new America. Uh, so I have a vision for a new America. Right. Hmm. Uh, and I think it's, it's fallacy to think that we can vision that new America a, as weaponized as we are, hmm. as hmm. tools, hmm. as we are made weapons of this current America. Yeah. Um, I, and, and I don't have a founding father. Like maybe a step, step, kind of stepfather, like I'm not, I can't, buy, I can't abide by that. Um, I can't abide by uh, continuing to try to negotiate for uh, a little push to the left, a little push to the left on someone's interpretation of uh, a completely, um, in, in, in inconceivably useless document for my body. I can't continue to try to have conversations about mm -hmm. Can we get someone that will interpret whether or not I should be recognized, yeah. that I, in my, in my Buddhist orientation, should be recognized as an equal child of God? Right. That I, in my queer body, should be recognized as an equal child of God, as an equal inhabitant of this planet, entitled to breathe, to be, to become however and whoever I want to be and become. This um, binding us to the notion that the Constitution <laughs> is the fundamental religious document of this country is our greatest fallacy. Yeah, yeah. That, that we are continuing to try to have an argument about who the umpire is yeah. <laughs> for a game, a field, on someone else's field, on some, someone else's, they've set all the rules, 
They decided how the teams are going to be divided. They call all the shots, it, their stadium, all the things. And I want to have a conversation about who the umpire is. Yeah. I'm sorry, not my conversation. And not my father, because to keep looking towards a, a, an abusive father that never had me in mind, that as, he, as the documents were written, the word all never included this body. It is dysfunctional. Now, it is not my father's problem if I remain in this dysfunctional relationship. And asking my father to fix that dysfunction is hypocrisy at the highest order and a lack of understanding about my own truth and compassion for myself and consideration for myself and consideration for my brothers and my sisters and my siblings that continue to labor under, under the tyranny of that father. Yeah. My job is to get us out of that house and move us towards building a new one but first we have to disarm ourselves of the ways in which our vision is limited, our vision of what is even possible, which is why you even have this conversation. Our vision of what is even possible is so severely limited by capitalism. Mm -hmm. It is so severely limited by patriarchy. It is so severely limited by imaginations and the myth and madness of white supremacy. That it's even hard for us to think about leaving in the same way in any kind of domestic abuse relationship that someone cannot see themselves alive and thriving outside of this house of abuse. Yes. I have a big imagination and I can see it. Can I answer that question? You, Can I answer please. that question? Please. Um, I, 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 want, I went to uh, Red Letter Christians in, in mm -hmm. October. I don't know why they asked me to come. <laughs> you know, I was like, did I have any kind of badge on my website that said I'm a Red Letter Christian? I did not. So I'm thinking I'm getting invited to spaces now from progressive evangelicals who are like trying to find out, you know, what yeah. she gonna say? <laughs> and I just showed my ass at the Red Letter Christians. <laughs> And, 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 here's, and, here's, and here's what I said in a nutshell. So I'm speaking to all the people there and all the people that didn't hear it and all the people in here who don't know what I would say. I was like, okay, A, stop acting like God is so puny that God only speaks Christian. Right. Like just, let's start there. And that's not a novel idea to middle church, but it's a novel idea in the world. I'm like, mm -hmm. who, what, what kind of... What kind of God is that, mm -hmm. that only speaks one language, mm. that, only, that only wants 144,000 people in relationship to her? What kind of God? And then two, stop giving God a penis, because he doesn't have one. <laughs> and then three, stop acting like the same God you say created everybody in her image doesn't know how to make beautiful queer people. Right. Mm -hmm. And like, stop that. <laughs> And four, stop trying to act like our job is to convert all the people to this thing well, that isn't anything that we want to be a part of. Okay. Not me. That's I don't right. want to be a part that's of it. Right. So stop it. That's stop right. acting like Muslims are not, Buddhists are not, Jews are not. Stop it. A atheists are not. How, how do you know? Mm. That is not our project. That's right. So, so our, uh, our, my project as a... Christian Universalist, parenthesis, post-Christian Christian. -Christian. <laughs> I'm still in that. I'm still in that. You know what I'm saying? Right, I like I that. Don't, like, no, I follow Jesus. But not I their I follow Jesus. Yeshua, but not theirs. That's not that exactly. blue white meme. Yeah. Not that guy. <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I don't follow that guy that hates my family. Right, right. I don't follow that guy who would lynch my people and to have to take a picture of it in the name of Jesus. Mm. I don't follow that guy who still would put on a hood, except you don't have to hide being a white supremacist fascist today. 
So I'm saying I'm declared that. Mm. Middle church is declared that. Mm. They don't leave, most people. We are not those people mm. thinking that we, our job is to convert people to Christianity. Mm. Our job is to liberate the people mm. from injustice right. by any means necessary except killing people. Right. That, that's my answer. And I do have a vivid imagination for that. But I think we have to break down the house. Mm -hmm. And I think if the preaching project or the writing project as Christian theologians isn't breaking down the house, we're in the wrong job. Right. And I think breaking down the house means building a new house in which there are rooms for lots of people and in which the language is varied. That's right. And in which everybody can love who they love. And I'm not, I mean, that is just, that is what it has to be. So I wanted to just go out loud. When you come to church tomorrow, Christians, mm -hmm. surprise, surprise, there's a different kind of theology at work in here. Yes, and I invited Angel Kyoto Williams on purpose to come and debunk the, Christ of, the myth of Christian America. And I invited Kelly Brown Douglas to come and help us to break that down. And my white post-Christian husband designed that part of the conference so we can stop pretending like Christian and America are the same thing, that Christian and justice are the same thing, that Christian and liberation are the same. They're not, They're not. until we make it so. That's right. I can see it. We got a long way to go. And goodbye. <laughs> Who's got the next question? Good morning. My name is Amy Brooks, and I met Angel at Sister Giant in the hallway. I didn't want to meet her, but I kept saying, like, well, if, if I see her again, I'll say hi. Or if I, and I kept seeing her, and then she was walking away, and I was like, oh, there she goes. And then she stopped and turned around. And I was like, oh my gosh, I have to, <laughs> have to say something. But I wish that I could have a private conversation with you about this, but you said that we should be speaking things in public spaces, but I'm scared, so I'm gonna be brave. Why, why do we need Christianity at all? Like why, why do we need these patriarchal religions that have been abusive and these structures that are inherently dysfunctional? Why can't we bravely move into new paths or back to old? earth-based matriarchal spaces that honored things that we don't see honored in these mainline Christian, Muslim, Jewish, and maybe Buddhist, I don't know, um, faith traditions. Why do we have to fix it? Why can't we? I don't, I don't know that we have to fix it. I think I'm not the best person to respond to that because I actually don't think we have to fix it. Um, I, I think that we have to divorce ourselves of the myths that we've that we have inherited, uh, and then we and then we have an opportunity. So th one of the things that's sort of quite key to Zen Buddhism is a notion of emptiness, and so it's kind of a discarding and an unlearning of everything, uh, because it suggests that you 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 are so skewed that even your idea of creating something new is always with the, 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 the uh, rubble of the, old, of the old thing, and so you end up rebuilding it. And the only vision, the only way, sight you have been, you understand yourself to have been given is the sight that has been allowed to you by this construct. And so, uh, the, the indigenous, there are indigenous people that have a saying that says, uh, well, if you get lost, you turn your shirt inside out, right? You turn your shirt inside out. So you have to turn your shirt inside out and realize that all of what you see a, a, and, and perceive and your way of constructing things that is external to you, you inherit it. And, and you didn't inherit just, you know, just what you wanted and what you thought was like useful. You inherited all of the things. And so if you don't turn your, and you know, I'm so glad that Kelly said like, it is only our faiths that are going to be able to do this. And, and I would say faiths writ large, right? In indigenous ways, right? And understanding from First Nation people and, and native peoples um, that are going to help us, because we have to turn our shirt inside out so that we, so that we can disavow ourselves and, and divorce ourselves from even our way of being able to perceive how to undo it. Because we rebuild it, we didn't, we're not the first people that arrived and said, this, you know, this white supremacy thing, it's a problem. 
and we should try to do something about it. And, what, and we recreated some vo- form of it. So there's something like that's deeply internal about getting in touch really deeply with our um, intrinsic compass of liberation that is required for us to see our way through. And then if what we come and see through is, is the love of the model of a man called Jesus, then so be it. Yeah. Right. If what we come through and see is the love of a model of a, of a man in a, in a high caste in India that said, I'm gonna put that aside, then so be it. But if it's women, so be it. And if it's plants, so be it. And if it's spirits and medicine and the trees, then so be it. I'm saying that it, it, it's not out there. So the notion of even not fixing it is something that comes from our own, from, from the lens that we've been given, right? The destru- lens of destruction and of tearing things down that actually sets us against each other in ways that we can't even understand, right? So, and so I'm not for or against, right? But what, is, what am I gonna come through? Kelly. Yeah, yeah, I yes. affirm, first of all, yes, yes, all of that, and I do. And, uh, and I affirm, you can say there, uh, the things that Reverend Lewis said as well, uh, in terms of we're talking, I don't care what door you get through, you, the door that's best for you. Mm -hmm. And so we're talking about faiths. (laughs) Uh, uh, And we're also talking about, as we talk about that, and in the language that I use, a God who is known through God's creation. Mm -hmm. Uh, That's not a binary creation, never has been. It's not binary in terms of the way in which people are embodied, the way in which people uh, come to know who they are. It's not a male-female binary. It's not a hetero, uh, what non-hetero binary. Uh-uh. It's how do we know that? Because people don't fall into the binaries, and then the rest of the created order doesn't. So to to deny that any person is sacred is really to deny God. That's right. Well, but in terms of Christianity, to this point in particular of Christianity, it's, it's, it's sort of the question that feminists uh, asked some time ago that Malcolm X put forward. You know, if there's something, if Christianity has had a long history of being this way, i.e. oppressive, uh, uh, and continues to be this way, i.e. oppressive, is there not something wrong with Christianity itself, right? Well. Yes, good question. But I, I think that Christianity, uh, as any religion, but Christianity, and I won't go into what I think some of the particular things are about Christianity that allow it to be particularly toxic mm. when it finds itself bound to power. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and it makes it particularly toxic. One of those things that we must resist is that there is a strand, a dominant strand of Christianity that is not simply monotheistic. It's okay if Christians say, I only believe in, uh, I I go through the door of of Jesus, that's okay. But it's not okay to say that's the only door. And there is a strand of Christianity from ad infinitum, that says, I call it a closed monotheism, that not only are we monotheistic, but that's the only God around in the cosmos. That's not okay. And that kind of thing, when linked with power, becomes problematic. More than problematic, it becomes toxic. So now, here's, it's violent, I like it, sociopathic, it's all of those things. So here's what I say, that we have to uh, in agreement, of course, found fundamentally with what uh, Reverend Williams said, but we have to ask, when did we have a Christianity that looked like something that Jesus would recognize? Mm-hmm. <laughs> that might a, a little, bit, little bit come from him? Mm-hmm. Now, it's got to matter that we're talking about a faith tradition with a daggone crucifixion at its center. That's got to matter. 
and it doesn't seem to matter for most Christians except they get to wear this empty cross around their neck. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and so it matters because it means that Christianity, that cross signals that fundamentally, Christianity to know the Jesus that died on that cross is to know him from the bottom up. Mm -hmm from those people who are the crucified classes. And so when we don't know it that way, then Christianity becomes toxic. Amen. And so what I like to say in shorthand without saying too much, here's the thing, Christianity <laughs> and power don't go together, and I'm sorry, you can't be white and Christian, it just don't work. Uh, uh, and so whiteness is an anathema to Christianity, and power is an anathema to Christianity. Amen, I know you have a question. I just wanna say, and stay, I mean stay, culturally. Stay tuned tomorrow for a conversation with Ruby and me about black folks' religion. Mm -hmm. I, I think, I think I, what I am, I say I'm post-Christian, but I'm still with Jesus. I'm still with Yeshua. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm with Yeshua ben Joseph. Uh, and, and I think that there's something redemptive in that, in the prophets, in the teaching, in the crucifixion. There's something with that. So I have a feeling we could get back to that. Yeah, and let me say something. Yeah. Just one more thing about uh, what I'm talking about. If you, so let's be clear when I say you can't be white and Christian, and this is, uh, I will give credit to uh, James Cohn. I think it's like footnote 29 on page 26 <laughs> of his Black Theologian, uh, Black Theology of Liberation. Just because you look like a white American don't mean you got to act like one. Yeah. And so that's, that's, what I'm, that's what I'm talking about when you can't be white and Christian. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Aisha Hauser. Um, how much do we compromise to rebuild the house? Because compromise got us the Clinton crime bill, right? Compromise, so um, I had a rich conversation last night about what it means to be rooted in liberation. And you know, I hear the phrase radical left, and I'm like, but what does that mean? We wanna build home, I live in Seattle, which is the most racist city I've ever lived in. I've lived on three continents and five states in this, on an insidious racism. I know you've been to Seattle a lot. That's what I, I have. Um, so how much do we compromise? What is it? What do we do? Say, well, we don't want to leave people out. I can have compassion and agape love for folks who are heinous, or I think their behavior is heinous, but how much do we compromise on the road to liberation? Mm, that's a good question. That's a great question. I, mean, I don't, I don't, I think we're uncompromising about liberation. Yeah, I was, that's what I was going to say. I don't yeah. think we compromise. Yeah, we are, it, 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 we are uncompromising about liberation and we have to allow for the fact that people are in really different locations around um, the, the willingness and even capacity to have um, touched their own humanity and be in contact with their own humanity. Uh, Whiteness in America has necessarily disembodied white body people from their bodies, right? So they are disembodied, so they can't feel. And if you can't feel your own humanity, how are you gonna feel anyone else's? And so the work of being, so whereas you may think about, it's like I'm, I'm, I'm concerned about how to leave that person out. I'm really concerned for, for their liberation and, and what it takes to get them to touch their humanity. In the meantime, I might keep them far away from impacting the experience of my humanity, but I'm really concerned, uncompromising, that they be liberated from the ways in which they are disconnected from their humanity because they will always be our problem because there isn't an us and a them. Yeah. It's, it, Exactly. James Baldwin puts it just that way, right? That the persons whose humanity is really at stake are the persons who don't recognize That's their humanity exactly right. is at stake, right? right? And, uh, and so I, I just affirm that. And the other thing, agape love isn't <laughs> all this squishy, squishy, and you can stay where you are. Right. No? Love, love is demanding. Love is demanding. Yeah. Love, is demanding. love we're talking That's about. Right is justice, That's right. right? And so you can't let people, you don't compromise with saying, oh, you okay where you are? Mm -hmm. No, actually you aren't because you've, you have betrayed your own humanity. And so what we have to be committed to is moving this way for, we're, doing, we're trying to move toward a, a just earth. 
you know? And if you want to come along, then come along. But we keep, because if we keep moving, we aren't letting you stay there. And I so agree. You know, Freud says that the limit, I, I love this sociopathic thing. Mm -hmm. And Freud <laughs> is so, you know, it is so, so, I love it because- I, have, well, I woke up one day and I was like, well, good goddamn. Right. <laughs> Because, well, you yeah. know what? because trying to say it's just violent, like That's still relegates it somewhere that doesn't understand it's one's, that, like it's my it's disease. Deep. It is your disease. It is my disease. Right. It is my, right, it's my disease. And I have to work and, and get off that thing of like, I gotta help you. Right. I'm because a, I'm that's a, what I'm gonna help you. Because oh. that's what I'm gonna say. Freud <laughs> says, one, you know, to be a sociopath means that your moral compass is missing. Now we, that's right. we know that what that looks like writ large. So, <laughs> so, and Freud has said that the sociopathic condition is the limit condition Mm -hmm. In terms of psychology, you can't, what do you do with it? You can't, it can't be fixed. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, there's certain things that I just got to leave to the higher power. It's like, Lord, mm -hmm. you take care you take of them. Care of <laughs> right, mm -hmm. I mean, so, so, but that's just it. Mm -hmm. You know, we can't fiddle with that. Mm -hmm. And what Freud says then is that just what you just said, mm -hmm. you have to protect other people in society from right. that sociopathic personality right. because it's harmful and it's toxic. Right. So you are just, we gotta, you know, they've lost their humanity. And mm -hmm. so what we can do now is move forward uncompromisingly toward a more just earth mm -hmm. and protect society and others from that kind of diseased mm -hmm. toxicity until they get Amen. it together. Until they get it together. Everybody's yeah. not going. <laughs> That's no, I mean, exactly yeah. right. everybody's that's exactly right. right. And I think that's the hardest uh, not, thing well, in a Buddhist faith would say, not in this not lifetime. In this not lifetime. in this lifetime. Not in this lifetime. I mean, the, I Buddhists mean say, the Buddhists yeah. be lucky. We'd be like, well, everybody, but maybe not in this not lifetime. In this lifetime. <laughs> 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 Amen. Or like C.S. Lewis would say. C.S. Lewis, when boat. he was in the screw tape letters, C.S. Lewis uh -huh. wrote about, um, anyway, the way, wait, maybe, let me say it shorter, Wormwood. What, what's with these Christians? They're saying prayers and you know, they lose their faith because you don't answer them. And, and uh, mm. um, it is said, God has God's unbounded now mm. to heal, to fix. So I like mm. that this is another lifetime. I also like this feeling of between the now and the not yet, we can have hope. Yeah. Uh, but everybody's not coming right now, and I don't think we can focus on all those people. We have to keep toward a liberative journey. Yeah, yeah. well, you know, it's like the, uh, our enslaved uh, forebearers. I mean, there were people that were born into uh, slavery, died in slavery, never, mm -hmm. ever dreamt that they would breathe a free breath. Yeah. Yet they fought for yes. freedom anyhow. Yeah. That's right. And they fought for freedom that they knew was greater than any freedom, any That's justice right. that humanity could ever enact. Right. And they fought so for right. it and lived into it and they trusted it. And we call it in tradition, the freedom that was God's. And so that's where we move it. Amen. Amen. Okay, I feel like I went to school today. Woo! <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Reverend Angel Kilda Williams, thank you, thank you, thank you. Reverend Dr. Kelly Brown Douglas, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.